Well, I, I am Scottish, uh, but I am speaking English, if you'd, uh, if you'd uh, questioned that. I don't know if the Scots ever did anything important in uh, uh, Sydney, although I do know that the first Caucasian male who died in Australia was a man called Herbie Sutherland, who came from Orkney, the north of Scotland, who died uh, just as Captain Cook arrived here because he'd contracted some form of illness in the Pitcairn Islands. Well, let's not be very specific about what it was. It wasn't necessarily a good thing. Anyway, uh, we should move on. And I'm afraid I'm actually going to use some uh, uh, Scottish examples uh, in the topic I wanted to uh, address tonight. Um, I think that um, we live in a period when housing policies, as I've understood what they are, have fallen off the tables of government. They're in fragments and shards, unresourced to any significant extent by uh, levels of government. They have increasingly focused upon questions of the poorest people and homelessness. And it's important that these groups are well housed and that the neighbourhoods in which they live do not hold them back from further progress in their lives. But at the same time, we also live in a context, in a system, in a society where the outcomes from the housing system in terms of prices and wealth, and if I've heard it once in the last 10 days, I've heard it 20 times, people say, but in Australia, we're inured to the culture of rising capital gains and investment, and we don't really want to do anything about it. Well, that's how it, it seems right now, but if you look at the rising levels of debt, if you look at the falling rate of home ownership for younger people, the, the beginnings of crowding within your rental housing sector, and you want 25 more years of population growth and rising land values and land prices. That is fundamentally adverse in terms of environmental outcomes and social outcomes. It's divisive and separates those who own and those who don't in fundamental long-term ways that reduces social mobility. But it also, uh, my way of thinking, it reduces productivity and growth within the economy. If you want to be a nation who make your economic way, by trading off the next generation. You're not a nation who make your way by investing in human capital, nor by investing in business or innovation and good ideas, nor indeed as the UK. This sounds, actually this sounds a bit like a, a lecture from a Scottish Presbyterian church minister so far, but, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that to be the spirit, spirit, but I do think people have to take a hard look at where they see housing and where they see housing position. So that, I think as we move forward, as you move forward, uh, whether it's in Sydney metropolitan area or whether it's in Melbourne or wherever, uh, we will have market-led systems, and I think that that's not a bad idea. But on the other hand, there will be market failures in terms of information and decision-taking in which there are roles for intervention which are hardly recognised in Australia, let alone anywhere else. And there will also be concentrations of poverty and people in poorer housing that we have to deal with. And if we don't deal with them and the housing of people who are uh, less affluent, who can't afford to be owners, who have high uh, uh, rent to income ratios or huge price to income ratios, if we can't deal with these issues, you will not have a kind of functional effective metropolitan system to move forward. So dealing with housing issue is not a marginal issue. It's not just about homelessness and so on. But I'm going to focus on questions about renewal and disadvantage <laughs> and neighbourhoods and neighbourhood change. And how actually you could develop different ways of thinking about this in the Australian context. Uh, I've called this talk New Times, New Deals for Older Housing. And I've used the word deals... Partly as a little tease, because you're now all into city deals after last Friday's announcement about Better Cities Plan. <laughs> I couldn't work out whether it was a noun or a verb at the end, but let's, let's, assume, let's assume it's a verb for present purposes. Uh, and I think that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the remaking, particularly of social housing neighbourhoods. I'm going to use an example uh, of Glasgow. Uh, but also about some Canadian uh, uh, experiences, and then talk about how this might play differently in the context of New South Wales, Sydney, uh, Australia. Uh, if we look across uh, programmes for remaking social housing neighbourhoods, dealing with older social housing, 
they vary immensely in their scale and I'm going to end up hiding <laughs> uh, in their scale and location. In some, it's the private sector that leads. In others, it's the, the public sector. In others, non-profits. The support levels vary considerably. Uh, there are grants, there are loans. There has also been a much wider use of gain uplift in delivering social outcomes in poorer areas of poorer housing than you're used to in the Australian context. There's much potential to do things differently in that regard. There has also been increasingly a kind of multi-sectoral uh, involvement so that you don't just do the housing, you do the other things that contributed to people's housing poverty uh, and, and housing and poverty. And you also increasingly see community involvement in discussion about the trajectory of the place that they're in. I, I find this an extraordinary the extent to which this just doesn't happen within uh, public housing systems in Australia, or even in decisions about housing uh, stock transfers where you don't have to consult uh, uh, tenants in the process. And I think that there's a very dismissive view towards the engagement with people who are actually within these systems. So uh, the experience internationally uh, is generally much more pro-consultation and pro-community than in, in, in the Australian context. Uh, I think that uh, we also uh, have seen as the problem of affordability has kind of shifted up market into middle income households and younger people and getting people into ownership. Uh, funding, direct grant funding for these programs has fallen in the last 10 years and it's been more problematic. Um, when we look at the evaluations that there have been in general, uh, some quite mixed. There are some very successful programs. There are some that have been less so, and there have been some outright failures. So there's no guarantee that investing in upgrading of social housing is going to make it better. Uh, there's no guarantee that there's one solution that works for everybody. It's about how you design it and how you deliver it in particular contexts. And that, that in a sense, is why we have to think of an Australian uh, 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 solution. But if we're to do effective, good, strategic public management of cities, not just deal in a heartfelt way with distributional issues about disadvantage, we have to start thinking about these issues and begin to use the resources and assets that are there in more effective ways to deliver the outcomes that will prove, improve outcomes, not just for the poorer people there, but for wider systems and cities. Now, Glasgow, 1974 to 2014. Hmm, in 15 minutes, uh, well, five minutes. Let's do it. Um, basically, Glasgow uh, is characterised <coughs> by economic decline and not growth. Uh, at least between 1953 and 1996, it declined. The de economy actually declined in scale every year. It's actually been growing again for the last 15 or 20 years because if you persist you don't have to end up with Detroit-like outcomes. Uh, but traditionally, it was all the private housing in the city centre, four-storey walk-up tenements built in the 1880s, 1890s, hit by rent controls in 1915 that stayed pretty much in place for about 60 years. So what did you get? You had decline in the quality of the property, you had concentration of poorest households into these areas, so that the real problem in the Glasgow context in 1974 was a huge scale, low quality, uh, traditional uh, housing uh, context. And it wasn't just one neighborhood, but in the city center, there was about 28 neighborhoods uh, with a population of about 60 to 70,000 who were living in housing that was below the official tolerable standard. So that was a huge, you don't have that crisis we had that crisis. Uh, this initial reaction to it by the City Housing Authority, who was the largest public housing provider in Britain at that time. They owned 140,000 public housing units in, in the, the early 1970s, i.e. you'd have had both Victoria and New South Wales public housing in the one city in terms of total stock, and I'll come back to that later on. But the initial idea was, well, we the city, we'll, we the public sector, we'll just buy it out and we'll, we'll do it up with grant aid from the government and we'll just make it part of the municipal housing stock and rehabilitate it, not demolish it. So this was quite a big switch. The, the only problem they had in that was 
they were really inefficient at organizing dealing with people. There wasn't a great tradition of tenant involvement in public housing. You can't renew neighborhoods without engaging with people that actually live in them. So that they were so slow in doing the first few schemes that actually I think about a third of the residents had died of old age before there was any actual uh, progress because there was quite elderly people. <laughs> they didn't take that that long, but there was certainly erosion of the existing population. Um, so that uh, people began to have real doubts about this. And at this point, the uh, Housing Corporation, which was largely uh, based in London, was looking for a role in Scotland at the time. And they thought, hmm, we'll take on neighbourhood renewal in the Scottish context. And what they did was they got grant money from government for housing associations to buy out uh, the worst of these places. And they would buy them out in territories that ranged between 1,000 and 2,000 units. Actually, it was more than that, but there was a lot of demolitions and uh, uh, closures within the properties and mergers of, of the properties. So that basically you had these not-for-profits uh, running with a difficult housing stock, engaging with the community, largely driven by grant funding. Okay? I'm not suggesting that you'd ever get anywhere close to this. And that's not the, I'm not arguing about going back to that. I'm just talking about how this model evolved. And they took places like that. Uh, these properties are in an area called Partick near the university. And they're symbolically important because that was where women had rent strikes in 1915 that actually started off the process of rent control that led to eventually the real decline in the quality of uh, the property. But uh, in the last uh, 40 years, they were taken over again uh, by housing associations. And once they began to stabilize these neighborhoods, the vacant land next to them lifted up in value. And what went on to these uh, uh, areas of land was uh, home ownership and market rented housing. Uh, the rather uh, uh, designed, shall we say, uh, modern building in the middle is a uh, private rental private rental units. The lower uh, uh, modern buildings in the back are home ownership, uh, and there's uh, mainly other housing association uh, units round about. In other words, you start from a position where the public has to make the necessary investment to create the conditions for the private sector to respond. Um, and the private sector has uh, responded significantly in these places so that a lot of these neighbourhoods that were uh, pretty much uh, dominated by low quality private rented housing are now about 60% uh, uh, non-profit, about 20% uh, home ownership and about 20% modernised uh, market rent rented housing. And they're changing again. Uh, some of the quality uh, of stock put up by housing associations, this involved some grant but it's quite close to the Glasgow city centre. There was a big land value uplift with this project. And this is uh, part of the famous Glasgow slum area of the Gorbals, which now has been renewed for the fourth time. Uh, it was renewed three times for the public sector and singularly failed every time. Uh, this has really shifted the nature of the neighbourhood, driven, of course, and been able to uh, build on the back of demographic change that's taken more younger people back to city centres and the like with employment growing, but you know that story here too. And uh, some of the quality of urban design is uh, really very good. As I explained to some students the other day, it's not that the uh, residents now have Jaguar cars. That happened to be the Minister for Housing from Victoria who was visiting... Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, then didn't implement any of the schemes. This is all a mix of home ownership, home ownership, low cost, relatively low cost home ownership, and social rented housing in a neighborhood that nobody would touch. Basically, the non profit, by going for design and quality and standard, de risked the investment for the private sector. There's a synergy there that needs to be remembered in these kinds of investments. That model worked in the inner city. And I wanted to show you that it had operated for something like 20 years before government, by the mid to late 90s, was beginning to focus on the problem of not the inner city. And Glasgow had re remade its inner city. People will tell you it was a city of culture and its art and fashion. No, it wasn't. It was people 
working in housing associations and community-based committees that changed the city, that allowed people to feel safe enough to go to Glasgow, feel proud enough in their city and neighbourhood to attract events. So you build on platforms. In that sense, housing is an infrastructure for all kinds of other, a base for all kinds of other policies. But when it, as that was happening, uh, Glasgow had this huge public housing sector. Uh, it was actually 60 odd percent of housing in the city about 1960. It's now down to about, uh, well, there's no public housing in the city of Glasgow. We transferred it all in 2003 to the non-profit sector. But in the public housing sector, uh, it was becoming the problem by the mid-1990s. High vacancy rates, concentration of poverty, the downsides of the 80s were all collecting in the public housing sector. Now, uh, the, the poster child, uh, the, the, uh, the poster child children for this disadvantage argument are the peripheral public housing schemes, which were built in the 1950s. But within 40 years, or 30 years in many instances, they were financed in 60-year loans. We were actually demolishing them before they were paid off because they were out at the edge of the city. The population had increasingly become unemployed. Uh, unemployed people, older people had moved out. Uh, and they were increasingly being targeted to those who were really disadvantaged. So that right out on the edge of the city, you had a low-income population, and they didn't get back into the labour market. This is a potential danger for Australian cities in a different way. If you ever have a big downturn, I wouldn't expect the relatively low-skilled people who live around the suburban edges of Australian cities are going to really struggle in terms of adjustment in labour markets. But we did it in the public housing sector. And these were massive places. This is uh, Drum Chapel, which was built for 25,000, 30,000 houses. And you can see, again, four-storey walk-up. Every house in that picture, every one, even in the distance, they're all public housing units. OK? So this was public housing neighbourhoods, public housing sectors. For a long time, Glasgow was a public housing city. But people were leaving. So that on the edge, you had the abandonment of public housing, then would demolish it, but the debt remained on uh, the local authority's housing account. Uh, so what would happen? Rents would uh, have to be diverted. A greater proportion of the rents actually collected would be devoted to paying for the loans that existed, for the houses that didn't exist. Uh, so maintenance and repair would be squeezed down, so more people would leave. So you were on a dynamic uh, that was actually... Uh, in a sense, going to crash the uh, housing department. People didn't like their public housing. When they left it, it's not... Uh, it's a, an old folks' home on the right-hand side. The left-hand side, you can see people were burning down where they lived. Now, I know that's not your problem. Uh, not yet. Uh, then <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, out the outcomes uh, really required some really radical change. And it was all about not just the housing, it's about the complementary things that go around it. I'm showing you physical things, but whole things like school and health and all the social services you need to make places work had to be rethought. So then you demolish things, so you leave gap sites. Uh, and what do you do if you start to reinvest? As you can see, it was right on the edge of the city. Well, um, they started to say, we want to stay here, we want to build communities, we want to involve housing associations in this process. So we started developing, we transferred public housing stock in small amounts. About 14,000 houses were transferred in about seven years in Glasgow to the non-profits who were set up in these estates. And they began to build different housing types. And they also began to work with private developers who'd identified that on these public housing estates, there were young people who actually were succeeding in terms of being in the labor market and having wages uh, and wanted to be homeowners. Uh, so if they wanted to be homeowners, they had to leave the estates. In other words, you were pushing out. You were demixing the social structure because of the absence of any variety in, in tenure. And they began to build progressively built better uh, uh, private housing uh, in, in different ones. So the key lessons from all the, the Scottish story were a strategic long-term commitment you don't pick this up and you put it down. You actually say this is a fundamental part of the strategy of a metropolitan area. Uh, 
you use the community, and you use the community to drive things, and you give non-profits control over assets in the process, because they have a flexibility to do things that the public sector did not have. Public sector still deals in silos in a way that non-profits or any states can do things rather differently and develop more like community development corporations operate in the United States. It was more flexible in its financing and in changing the scope. As these associations began to take on wider roles, it quite often would have taken the local authority five years to negotiate that different services got delivered as a package or different investments got made together. If you are the social entrepreneurs who are driving change in that area, you just do it. You just assemble the things. You don't have to go through the kind of bureaucratic or political structures that you have to if you retain this within the public housing estate. So that there was much more rapid progress and the wider agenda for renewal, which was then being accepted by government, was something that these entities could play into in a very effective uh, way. Uh, there's also the issue about quality pays off. If you do good quality design and good quality work, uh, you create a lot of pos positive benefits. There was also some other aspects about retaining some kinds of contestability and subsidies and so on, so that you don't create just local neighbourhood monopolies, new monopolies. You have to think carefully about how you do that. Uh, and you've got, uh, uh, I think... Um, quite a bit of scrutiny emerging over what a successful organisation will look like in the longer term. When we moved on to a much more pronounced uh, pattern of housing stock transfers, and I want to say something about that before I finish, we didn't think very much about what the organisations were for. In Scotland, we didn't do any arm's length management transfers, management only transfers. We only did asset transfers because, and I worked in government at the time we took that decision, because we didn't think that the uh, uh, arm's length transfer was anything other than simply an admission that you couldn't manage the stock very well yourself. Um, but that we had always a view that, first of all, community was really important in, in the process but also we recognise that flexibility in using the assets, not just managing the income streams, but using the assets was really important. And non-profits have much greater flexibility in how they use the assets to support different tenures, to support leverage, to support uh, taking a private finance than uh, the public housing entities actually had. And I think that that's an issue, and I know it plays out very different ways in different states, and there are different... Uh, attitudes uh, within treasuries and indeed uh, within uh, housing departments. But I would uh, challenge anyone at the end of the day uh, to the question of whether or not a management transfer will ever be more effective in the long term in terms of complexity and change and dynamic and use of assets than a well-organized non-profit would be. But that's, uh, <coughs> that's uh, for later on. In the Canadian context, uh, OK? Um, in the Canadian context, uh, they have big cities in the Pacific as well that have big docks. Uh, this is actually the docks at Vancouver. Uh, they also uh, have cities in eastern Canada. Uh, this is a view uh, from the uh, uh, window of the office for the Minister for in Infrastructure and Cities in Ottawa. Uh, I was meeting him about three weeks ago, and he wasn't there uh, when I turned up, so I thought I'd take this picture because if you look just right close to Parliament, right close to downtown, and if you look at that strip of land along there, there has been a whole series of failed attempts to use uplift, uh, simply because the government were too mean about what they were trying to achieve, and they wouldn't put in any non-profit expenditure. And for whatever reason, as a scheme, it never really developed effectively. They're now rethinking it. But going back to the Canadian setting, um, there's, uh, I think, an interesting thing, and I wonder if you should do it in Sydney. Uh, in Toronto, uh, a number of the nonprofits and others set up something called the Toronto Housing Action Lab about two years ago, which was a lively discussion of people like this to talk about how you change things, how you move things forward, how you do creative change in these contexts, and actually, 
the, uh, the, the person that ran, ran this is now Chief of Staff for the Minister for Infrastructure. So that was quite a convenient transition for the people involved in this conversation. But getting a dynamic about how you would do it differently. There's a very interesting conversation emerging in Canada just now because they've just emerged from roughly a decade of a pretty harsh uh, fiscal uh, and attitudinal environment on the part of their, their, the federal government. In Vancouver, I think that all Australian cities should look at the role in, uh, uh, of delivering affordable housing in Vancouver, where the uh, city of Vancouver uh, identifies quite large chunks of territory, might be two, 3,000 houses. It might be the former Olympic site, former rail yards. It's quite often using public land. They will actually make compulsory purchases and acquisitions of that. Uh, they will then do any environmental upgrading that's necessary, any restructuring, uh, and also they will decide what the public policy objectives are for that site and that place. What do they want from this development? They then form a master plan. They then auction the master plan. So the state expenditure role finishes at that point. They take all the gain from the infrastructure uh, uplift. They take all the gain from the planning uplift and they deliver in some of these schemes, quite commonly, 20 to 25% affordable housing. And I think that there's a Vancouver in that respect is so similar to Australian uh, cities that that's their standard practice. And they have done a job that could have been done in Melbourne and could have been done in Sydney. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's not say there's different contexts and so on. It could have been done if people had the will to do it. So that's the first thing. And I think they've been outstanding in terms of gain extraction and a private sector-led uh, development, but in which the private sector develops, uh, negotiates with the non-profits to introduce non-profits in ways that support the development. And I think that that works out uh, quite well. Different approach in the shambles of Mayor Ford, the now late Mayor Ford uh, of Toronto, where just next to the CBD, there's an old area, called Regent's Park. It was, I, once, <laughs> I once made a bad mistake when I first went there and speaking to the city of Toronto. I said, this looks as if it was designed and built and managed by people who'd fled from Glasgow City Council uh, and, and discovered that half the staff that worked there had formerly worked in Glasgow City Council. <laughs> mm. Anyway, they didn't throw me out, but they transferred their housing, uh, not full asset transfer, which is a... a, a qualification, but a significant transfer uh, to the T Toronto Community Housing Corporation. It's about 35, 40,000 houses. Uh, they identified this area called Regent's Park, which had 5,000 uh, run-down social housing units. And basically, without any significant federal support or indeed provincial support, they used a land value uplift from being in the huge successful engine that's the Toronto economy just right next to the CBD to actually restructure it so that they now have 3,000 uh, social rented units and 2,500 owner-occupied units. And the owner-occupied units have effectively paid for the renewal and regeneration. It's been sorted out into a neighborhood that's uh, quite impressive or potentially very impressive. It's an attractor to the city and it didn't displace the social sector tenants. So that was the case where the public sector working with non-profits took the lead but have engaged the private sector to a significant extent. So different practice in different places, but both Vancouver and both Regents Park have been enormously successful, and they've done more than housing in the ways that they've done this. The Ottawa uh, disaster I mentioned. Well, if we move on very quickly before Sue kills me or before you decide it's time to go and watch the budget... Uh, <laughs> If you want to listen to a really boring economist, go and listen to the budget. <laughs> um, what do you do then in the new times that you're in uh, with uh, city deals on the horizon, for those of you that uh, keep up with these things? First of all, take a citywide and metropolitan perspective to what we do on this. And don't just focus on the questions about the poorest and the homeless when you make the cases for housing change in Sydney, Sydney, but don't forget them either. Make a case it's about productivity and the economy, 
and how these things impact the economy and costs of provision of services as well, rather than simply about uh, at low incomes. And think about what are the roles, particularly for non-profits, what are the market failures as well as the poverty that you're trying to address? Housing uh, lobbies and housing policymakers have not thought about market failures and how you address them. But the supply side failure uh, is the key issue. I'm not saying it's all down to market failures. There's uh, inelastic land supply uh, in the very nature of cities. Uh, but I think that there are th opportunities there to be thought through. Modernise the non-profit sector. So that's for you, uh, Wendy. I'll, I'll, if you like, I'll hide behind the pillar from that side. Uh, and maximise the potential from existing public assets. I think there should be a strategy to maximise the beneficial housing outcomes from existing public assets. That would include public housing stock, it would include public land, it would include a whole set uh, of, of uh, 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 stocks and transfers. And I think that the acute pursuit of planning and infrastructure induced gains have to be thought through strategically. Now, if the government paper of last Friday is serious, it mentions affordable housing quite often, but didn't show to me any connection about how you would get there. Housing is really important in this because housing will be an important way in which gain gets captured. Make sure that the non-profit or the social objectives are actually met within that framework too. Be absolutely clear that if there is a city deal for Sydney or bits of Sydney, there's a key housing dimension to it, both as an extractor of gain, but also as a user of gain surpluses in areas where you do need some public support to make change. So that these are the main things. Uh, I think that the ideological commitments that you get from, uh, I don't know about New South Wales, but having worked in the government of Victoria, very often when I dealt with the... Uh, uh, finance ministry, it was like dealing with people who were applying economics 101 uh, to a particular means of provision, i.e. defending public housing using a logic that showed just a complete ignorance of how housing systems actually operate. I, I, I could get thrown out in most countries for saying that, and I've probably been not thrown out, <laughs> encouraged not to come back, uh, but I do think there's a real issue about how the extent to which the combination of the simplistic finance ministry views about housing allied to producer interest within the public housing service has actually stopped any really significant changes taking place. Uh, finally, um, 10 things. Uh, Wendy, you see I skipped over the bit about modernising the social uh, uh, sector. Central agencies have to recognise housing impact. We have to articulate how housing shapes growth. We have to see how housing policy is about essential economic infrastructure. We have to uh, maximize the benefits from transfer of public housing assets and energized communities. There should be clear inclusionary zoning targets with housing in own occupation and non-profits with the, the two sectors working together in that to have a coherent strategy. I think that surpluses from housing market-led gains should be funding potential NRAS type supports for uh, middle market and uh, other, like, and even providing guarantees for silent second loans for uh, first time buyers in some of the, these neighbourhoods have been extremely successful in Ontario. Uh, I think that we want to see an expanding middle market renting and that could be partly done by non-profits in uh, areas that are neighbourhoods that are difficult. I think that we have to see a significant increase in infill investment by older households in the suburbs. Uh, well, by, when I'm saying by older households, I think there is a process that you need in Australian cities to incentivize older households to use their quite large plots that they have uh, in rather different ways over the longer term to increase housing supply. And I think that uh, we need to look at roles of non-profits and things like changing the mix of housing care and health provision. And uh, I think that you do need a new vision for a more stable and sustainable uh, housing market in Sydney. Uh, I have obviously some biases in that. I wasn't speaking entirely as a detached uh, academic guy. Uh, 
I like to think there is research evidence for most of what I've said, but if you feel you need to check, don't hesitate. Thank you.